If I could have and hold on to one thing, it would be the courage to pursue a world that I know could be taken away from me. It would be the strength to fight for a life that I know is not forever. And what do I mean? Well, maybe it'd be easier to first start with what the opposite looks like. Because the opposite is refusing to give a piece of your heart away because giving someone else your heart simultaneously gives them the power to destroy it. It's refusing to speak your mind, to take a chance, to give all of yourself to the world because you know the same vulnerability required to build you up could theoretically be used to tear you down. It's not going because you know that should you obtain what you're looking for, you then have to defend it. You have to fight to keep it. And you know that's not always a winning fight. That's why vulnerability is so hard. And it's both the solution and the problem. If you refuse to be vulnerable, you stand no chance. Right, because life requires risk. It requires skin in the game. But conversely, being vulnerable is also taking off your armor. It's removing the last line of defense against the onslaught of arrows flying through the air. Vulnerability is the cup of water required to live and the vast ocean capable of flooding a coastline. And this is exactly why, going back to my opening line, I ask and I seek the courage to run into vulnerability and never away from it. I want to be vulnerable enough that my heart can be broken in half. Because at least then I knew what it was like to love fully. I want to be vulnerable enough to give all of myself to the world because sure, some will attempt to tear me down, but I'll have gotten the opportunity to lift others up. I won't have lived a life in the shadows. And I want to be vulnerable enough to chase the tallest mountaintops. Because sure, I may fall, I may fail, I may find myself at its base looking up again. But at least I'll know I got the view. At least I saw the world from the vantage point of the clouds. And I don't take that lightly, right? Sometimes we skip the courage part altogether, right? seeking the ends. I want to find the love of my life. I want to build something meaningful. I want to reach the mountaintop. Yet we never put ourselves out there. We're not vulnerable enough to immerse ourselves into the chaos. We don't let our guards down. You don't need the thing. You need the courage to pursue the thing. You need the courage to let yourself become the kind of person who gets the thing. Then infinity is at your fingertips. I often remind myself that the sand from the hourglass continues to fall. And when it's gone, I won't be thankful for my excuses. I won't be thankful for the reasons I didn't go. I'll be thankful that I saw through them and lived a life of courage. I'll be thankful that for every reason to stop, I saw three to continue on. If I could have and maintain one thing, it would be the courage to pursue a world that I know can be taken away from me. It would be the strength to fight for a life that I know is not forever. Because then I'd be able to say with conviction that I built a world that meant something. And I lived a life I was proud of. It's not the thing that matters, it's the strength to pursue the thing, build the thing, become the type of person who achieves the thing. It's all the life that we live along the way. That's the beauty. 
So give me that. Or at least the courage to chase it. I always believed that possibilities were infinite. That nothing was off limits. And so I collected in this box my plans. And man, I had such a full agenda, right? If you look inside, you could see them. That one in the back, that was the plan I made to leave my job and start over. And there, that one, that was where I was going to build a better relationship with my sisters. That one, that was piano. I was going to learn to play piano. And that one, that's where I was going to move to a little cottage on the lake. I've always dreamed of seeing the sunrise over the water. And that's where I was going to start the business and begin a family. That's where I'd run my first marathon. But time slipped away and plans seemed to accumulate. The box became more and more full. And I started to realize that it was simply a holding pattern for a life I wasn't living. These little plans were IOUs, kept in a box to remind me what was real and what was not. Maybe I missed the point. So I put down the box, slid it back under the bed, and I stepped out my front door and little by little began piecing together that new life. The job, the city, the cottage by the lake, the piano, the new relationships. I immersed myself in the detail. And what I saw was a life changing in front of me, not because of plans, but because I moved forward without them. As the saying goes, if you wait for the perfect moment, you will be waiting for the rest of your life. While the things you want most, they remain tucked neatly away on a shelf, gathering dust, evolving into could-bes or would-haves. So now I keep that box empty, facing my bed, so when I wake up every morning, I remind myself to leave nothing for someday. So imagine years from now, way down the road, you're older, sitting on your front porch, kind of fists propped up under your chin, you're staring out and thinking about your life. You're thinking about the decisions you made, the things you did and didn't do. What would you be thinking? What would you change? Would there be regrets? Now there's a lot of research around this topic in, in one of the most important books written on it by Bronnie Ware talks about the regrets of the dying. And one of them is wishing I had the courage to live a life true to myself. Right, so you're sitting there, you're, you're looking out and you're imagining what if you acted differently? What if you tried? What if you started? And you go back to that moment where you were looking fate in the eye and you had to make that decision, right? That singular decision. It showed its face repeatedly, but the decision more or less remained the same. It was vulnerability or safety. Choose one. Vulnerability or safety. Safety. That innate desire to not disrupt or challenge the way things are. Even when you know in your core there's more out there. See, safety is the wolf in sheep's clothing. 
Watching life happen through a window is incredibly safe. But it means you're forfeiting the essence of life in exchange for a front row seat to watch others live it. It means you don't capture that adrenaline that drives us. You don't take part in the emotion that excites us. It means you don't meet the people who would change your life and you don't see the places that would take what you know of reality and transform it. No, equating safety with contentment is the product of outdated thinking, an outdated operating system. It's indicative of a way of looking at the world that used to be life or death, but now in 2020 in modern day society, it's regret. And the first step in changing something is to become aware of your current circumstance. It's to realize you're not wrong or guilty for thinking small or taking a back seat to fear. That's what humans do. It's our default setting. But it's your fault if you don't do anything to change it. It's your fault if once recognized you don't pick up the pieces and create a different narrative. You know, I always say the most important changes we can make, they're simple. They're not easy, but they are simple. And that road to something new always starts with seeing beyond the confines of the world that you've accepted for yourself. Understanding the reality that dictates your reasoning, thought patterns, and decision-making can change. Because my friends, if you can remember one thing and one thing only, it's this. Fear is not the enemy. It is the ally you need most. Inaction is the enemy. Doubt is the enemy, not fear. Seneca says we suffer more often in imagination than reality. Mark Twain has says do the thing you fear most and death of fear is certain. It's like jumping into a pool on a hot day. You get a second or two of discomfort before you can acclimate into something better. See, people are stronger than they think they are. They are adaptable. They are resilient. But to see this, we must move beyond the stories in our head. So back to that rocking chair, you're thinking back that fork in the road and maybe you choose the challenging path, the one that scares you and maybe you fall flat on your face. But you get up a little smarter, a little better equipped and you keep going. And maybe you fall and you fail again and again and then comes the criticism. But you see that maybe criticism doesn't kill you. In fact, it does nothing if you don't let it. And again, you pick yourself up and you carry on. And you pick up some allies along the way. You expand your skill set. You drive towards mastery. And day in, day out, you continue to fall, to trip. But eventually you look back and you see something you haven't seen before, distance. And you realize you are not the same person you once were. You realize what you have right now, simply through a process of falling and rising again, you have redefined your existence. You've redefined what's possible. You've redefined the people, the places, the things that matter. And it dawns on you that falling, that fear, that the unknown wasn't the problem, that that's not scary, it's just part of being better. It's the cost of greatness. You've been looking at things wrong, hiding from exactly the thing you should have been running towards, allowing into your life the very things that held you down, making you think comfort was the goal when it was shackling your feet to the ground and advising that spectating was a good thing. No, not you. 
And when you sit down on that rocking chair and you look out, thinking of the life you made, let it be one of adventure. The failures that made you stronger, the wandering that unveiled life's beauty, and the ends that became beginnings, because that is the essence of a life truly lived. It's easy to look back and think about all the things you could have done differently. Especially since as we get older, we get wiser, right? Time provides this beautiful gift of clarity. And ultimately we realize things like maybe a lot of our hesitation was unwarranted. Maybe a lot of our decisions uh, or indecision was fear-based. And knowing that, it's easy to look over your shoulder and feel like you could have lived a different life or taken a different path. At the very least, wish you'd done things differently. But the reality is, everything you've done has, in fact, taken you here, to this moment, and when you dwell on the past, the should-haves and the could-haves, you completely diminish the power of right now, the current moment. You completely underestimate the knowledge and the wisdom you've been collecting for years, whose single job is to assist you in your next move. It's a compounding of experience. The good, the bad and the ugly has landed you right here, right now, and how beautiful right here is. The infinite blank page. The forever fresh start. And that's not to say the past doesn't matter. It's to suggest that your prior discomfort, your mistakes and lessons have equipped you to deviate from the routines and the cyclical nature of your past, right? The past is a gateway to now, not a life sentence. And there's a difference. You say last year or last month or last week is valueless because you did X when you should have done Y. I say to that, doing the wrong thing has positioned you to now do the right thing. Potential energy, right? Like a spring being pulled back tighter and tighter and tighter, awaiting its opportunity to propel forward. You don't get that without those could haves and should haves. They're integral to the process. The reason you'll be different moving forward. You can say, I wish I'd taken more chances. I wish I was bolder. I wish I followed my heart. Two pieces of news for you. One that's fantastic. It seems as though you're now aware of those times you fell short and can therefore mitigate them moving forward. And two, you're not dead yet. We have to stop looking at yesterday like it's anything but a ladder to greater competency. The gymnasium for your decision making. Anyone can cherry pick the past. But the practical me asks, what does beating yourself up about what's gone do for you? What does it add to your life? except for enabling and legitimizing the same identity you're looking to evolve and move on from. See, we don't limit ourselves because of right now. It's always because of yesterday. Look what happened. Look what I lost. Look how things turned out. And it's like, take the data and trudge forward. 
you now have the tools to move right into that darkness of night. And in five years, you'll look back and sure, you'll wish you did things differently. And same five years after that. But that's why life is a journey and not a standardized test. We are picking up the pieces as we go, painting the masterpiece one brushstroke at a time. And even though you might wish yesterday's brushstroke was a different color, a little darker, different shade, it's just as valid as all the others in contributing to the mural in its totality. So sure, be your greatest critic but be your greatest ally as well. And that calls for being bold enough to let go of what's gone. Extract the value from yesterday and use it to build now. Something, anything, that's up to you, but hear the message. It's up to you now. Not who you were yesterday or what you did. Not how people saw you or how you used to live your life. You have an opportunity now to go wherever your heart desires. Stronger and wiser at this point in time than you've ever been in your life. So rather than dwell on what's gone, how about asking how you can take those pieces of yourself and build again. Standing on that ledge, staring out at what we know we need to do, at the moment we least want to do it, well, that's where the future is shaped. When procrastination feels like the answer or avoidance the optimal choice, where does one draw their strength? They say routine is a powerful tool in this fight. And, and I believe that when something becomes habit or part of the process instilled in the day-to-day, -day, there's just simply less room for negotiation. We show up with our eyes on the prize. But here's the thing, we are human. There's simply going to be days when the world pushes back. Life is a game of complexity. It's unpredictable. You want to talk about the good days? Fine. It's easy to show up when we're feeling good. And thankfully, those days outnumber the others, right? Creating the bulk of our consistency, 10,000 hours. But not all of them. I mean, life is about momentum. Myself, after coming off a pretty terrible weekend for a variety of reasons, I found myself on that ledge again. When the alternative route made itself known, where it felt mighty tempting to call it off, take a break where my worldview had come into question. I had to ask myself, who are you, really? It's easy to rationalize walking away in these moments. In his book, The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield says, our job in life is not to shape ourselves into some ideal we imagine we ought to be, but to find out who we already are and become it. Well, who would have known how much goes into that process of becoming? How committed we have to be to the road before us, and not only when it's sunny, but when the skies are dark and gray. And how if we allow ourselves in those difficult moments to say, sometimes it's okay to wave the white flag, it's okay to walk away. Then you leave the door cracked to make that same decision at any other point in time. Right? Quitting, conceding can very easily become a habit. And a habit we want to avoid at all costs. 
right? I have this uh, little rule that no matter what, I can never leave dishes in the sink overnight. Never. I treat this, you know, arbitrary little promise to myself like it's life or death. Which, again, random, but hear me out. It's, it's half practical, half symbolic. I know that if I say, okay, just this once, I've effectively removed the barrier separating order from chaos. If it's okay just this once, then it's okay 1,000 times. And a messy sink becomes a messy kitchen, becomes a messy house, becomes a cluttered mind. Extreme, maybe but critical, right? Here is where the symbolism comes in. I understand how fragile that divide, how when I'm tired or have a headache or I'm busy, it's still priority because I want to hammer my subconscious with the understanding that I show up when it's inconvenient. That very moment when, you know, I could easily trick myself into thinking it's small or dumb or arbitrary. It's a sink, who cares? Right, That's the moment that I need to bleed into the rest of my life. And I think that's exactly it, right? The floodwaters are always looking to come in. And how many cracks until the room gives way? You know, when you've had a few rough days, when you've lost something important to you, when you're sad or disappointed about an outcome, what then? When life calls you to exceed expectations, what then? Because the world around you will always give you evidence to support dialing it back, right? Selling yourself short, if that's the case you're looking to make. But here's the deal. Should you choose the inverse, you are strong enough to be better than you've ever been in those challenging moments. You can show up when it hurts. You can reestablish your why and carry forward even after the turbulence of yesterday. Life will never be easy. It will never all make sense. And this understanding uh, has helped me to roll up my sleeves and continue forward. When I'm disappointed with yesterday or overwhelmed by the conditions or landscape of the moment, when I question how much I have left. But I've found that when I look hard enough, there's always something to draw on. And that's the message of note. That's what we must show ourselves. When you're on that ledge, this can be where you're at your best. This is where you get to uncover just how deep rooted your greatness is. This is where you set the standard and the pace for everything to come. What does it mean to be a little better every single day? James Clear has noted that if each day you improve by only 1%, you'll be a full 37 times better in a year. That's an almost unfathomable number. Unbelievable transformation. Imagine being 37 times better at what it is you're looking to improve on. 37 times more efficient or skilled, all because of a 1% per day commitment. Almost sounds too good to be true. Here's the catch though, 1% doesn't seem like much, which is good, one might think. You know, that should make it easier. Well, sort of. The easier and more seemingly trivial something is to accomplish, the easier it is to dismiss it as well. We've all been there that, eh, maybe not today, maybe tomorrow. No big deal. We don't lose anything. And that's what we must learn to wrestle with. Right? Jim Rohn puts it this way. He says, being successful is easy. The issue is that being unsuccessful is easy too. 
Saying yes to the little things you know you need to do is easy. But so is saying no. Putting your phone away to work on something of substance, yeah, that's pretty easy. But watching just one more TikTok or Instagram or YouTube video, that's easy too. Putting your shoes on, going for a walk or run, heading to the gym, hey, procedurally, pretty easy. Not that complex. But talking yourself into just going tomorrow instead, also a rationalization that's pretty easy. And that's essentially the question, which easy are you going to go with? How do you put yourself in position to select the right easy? Well, like so many things, it starts with the worldview and flows out to the tangible actions we take in support of that worldview. First things first, we have to know that the biggest advantage available is seeing the small things as so much more than small things. It's refusing to fall victim to the disappointment and burnout associated with hoping for one huge jump, a miracle solution, the answer that will change everything. That's deceiving. Winning looks small and consistent. Progress is boring, it's mundane. It looks like deciding on what matters and then making a pact with yourself every day to keep your own promises. When most would fall off or push things to tomorrow, it's seeing your commitment as everything. Knowing that the people who manufacture significance in their lives they treat what others would call silly and trivial as life and death. They make the details into the whole storyline. So yeah, it might be easy for someone else to walk away. But when you have given yourself no other option but to succeed, the little steps to make it happen require zero thought or internal deliberation. The person who gets into shape over the course of six months they're not going to be the one who found a secret diet, bought a piece of equipment on Amazon. They didn't do the necessary thing here and there when they had their fleeting moments of inspiration. No, they made better, consistent decisions. No to the soda, yes to the water, no to the alarm, yes to the run, no to the Netflix, and yes to the gym. Both options were easy in the moments in which they arose but each time only one option mattered. And that's what it's about, tying the prolonged gratification to something that means the world to you, where each step is not just a step, but one step closer to the moon. So no, it's certainly not that a can of Coke or dessert or the day off will kill you, but flip the narrative. It's that when you do stay true to your mission and the promises you make to yourself, you get something so much more back. It's not, oh, what will I lose by skipping this 1%? No, in a world where excellence compounds, it's look what I am becoming. And this decision is an investment too good to pass up. And every decision to move forward to embrace the things that align with your true north is a nod to that future self. We spend a lot of time asking ourselves, what if things don't work out? What if I fall, fail, or miss the mark? What if I have to head home empty-handed, diminished pride, defeated? But what if we've simply been asking the wrong question? Imagine flipping the script. What if everything worked out better than you could have ever imagined? What if you learn in going 
that you have barely scratched the surface of your potential. That you've been accepting too little, leaving too much on the table. What if you learn that you are powerful beyond all recognition? Not because someone told you so, no, but because the very steps being taken prove the point. What if the things that held you down can be dismantled, the thoughts that held you back can be demolished? Why is it we don't ask more of those questions? Generally, you get what you look for. What you ask of life is what you shall receive, or so the saying goes. So my thought here is perhaps we need to ask for more. Not of the world, but of ourselves. There's an ocean of opportunity before us, enough of this pointing out and wishing for more while we wade in water that is waist deep. First steps will always be believing that more exists, that the world might not be able to see it, it might not exist to your left or right, but it exists in your head, and that is enough. That is where all great accomplishments start. It's the necessary beginning. And to disregard a perceived outcome because it's only in your mind, it hasn't materialized yet, is like disregarding a seed because it's not yet a tree. The two are forever intertwined. They need each other simple formula. See greatness and move towards that greatness. Nothing else is relevant. And sure, you'll have your struggle from time to time, no question. But that's not failure. That's what happens along the path to better things. That adversity is simply the price that must be paid for dreaming, for taking the ideal and bringing it to life. And at the end of the day, that price is a bargain. So ask yourself, what if things do work out? In fact, what if they work out better than I ever imagined? What if the current norms can be transformed, reality altered? What if this is just the beginning of the best life has to offer? You change the questions, you change the outcome. And today feels like the perfect day for change. What is failure? Perhaps when the plan falls apart? Maybe when the project results are underwhelming? No, not quite. When your heart breaks, momentum stops, when your world is shaken at its foundation? No. To put it simply, failure is not going. Failure is the plan never falling apart because you were too scared to make one. Failure is never being underwhelmed by the results of that project because you couldn't find the courage to start. Failure is no heartbreak. No setbacks, no challenge to your worldview because you stood still. I see life's disappointing occurrences as a sort of transaction, some temporary discomfort in exchange for the very wisdom you were looking for placed in the palm of your hand. You endure the pain to get the answers. You accept chaos today in exchange for the map that enables you to navigate the terrain. How can something be a failure if it places you right where you need to be? How can something be a failure if it brings you closer to the life you dream of. 
Maybe we don't look at life as failure versus success, but rather as being stagnant versus being in motion, immobile versus mobile. Maybe it's that simple. If you are moving, regardless of how fast you're giving yourself a chance to overcome, to collect wisdom and pick up armor, you're giving yourself a chance to be more tomorrow than you are today. And that means we stop accepting the notion that we are standing still for our benefit, justifying that we're only stationary because we're waiting for the right moment. We're here because we need this to be perfect. No, there are a million different ways to get what you want out of life, a million different paths to get you there. None of them require standing still. I already cringe at the amount of time I've wasted waiting for the right time. How I would sit on releasing this or starting that. Oh, it's because I'm a perfectionist only to learn that perfectionism is really just fear in disguise. You can sit there and wait and refine and refine and refine, but I'll tell you what, the one who moves, who creates, shares, collects feedback, adjusts and repeats, will have achieved that level of quote unquote perfection before you feel prepared to acknowledge and share your prototype. It was simply by going that evolution took place. And it took me a long time to grasp this, to understand it, and a part of me didn't want to believe it. As I found it inherently uncomfortable, but life rewards the bold. It always has and always will calling for a sort of calculated recklessness. Great things are achieved by doers who can put their egos aside and let the world humble them on their way to the next attempt. In Ron Chernow's biography on Washington, one of the common themes which I believe made Washington one of the most influential people in the history of mankind was his ability to think, analyze, seek out the opinions of people around him, and then, once decided that was that, he was all in. The rubber had met the road. This was now the way. And I find power in that as overthinking is so often our undoing, right? Weighing out worst case scenarios, contingency plans, this versus that. When progress requires that we sure spend a little bit of time deciding which general direction we go, but most importantly, that we start. And I think we've all been guilty of this over-analyzing, over-planning. But just like a sailor can't predict the winds, we can't predict all life's variables. Again, it's deciding on a general direction and then trusting ourselves to navigate life's obstacles as they arise. It's finding trends and patterns along the way and doing our best to utilize them as we move forward. There will be points where the road ahead seems overwhelming, the obstacles too abundant to make sense of, where the mind compels you to stay where you are and stare out in awe. It will suggest that what's behind you is safer, that the world you know contains fewer monsters than the world you don't. It might even convince you that whatever ambitions you had weren't really that important, that you could easily live without them. And the longer you stand there, the longer you listen to that voice, the louder it gets. You dismiss it with every step forward. 
your momentum is a dagger through the heart of any doubt that once tried to occupy the precious real estate behind your eyes. You don't have to outthink it, outsmart it. You just have to move forward. And what you find is that the mountains you once peered up at weren't all that they seemed. A culmination of little hills that can be climbed, manageable rocks that in actuality can be used to propel yourself up the mountainside. There was never a perfect path up. No magic transport to the summit. You might even think to yourself, what a shame that so many are still on the sidelines waiting to devise their perfect approach, making plans and drawing maps. But that's not how any of this works. To win, you go. To make progress, you move. Knowing full well that you'll find your dead ends. You'll spend time and exhaust energy going down certain paths that don't ultimately lead you where you wanted to go. But what a gift, the ability to reverse course and take the right at the fork instead of the erroneous left you previously took. Your errors are not permanent. Your errors are correctable. Stagnation is what's permanent. Wishing is permanent. Someday is permanent. But right now, that's pure value. So next time you find yourself looking out, as we all do, remind yourself that there are many ways to transform your reality for the better. Many paths to the mountaintop, but there is only one way to assure you never get there, and that is standing still. So trust yourself to figure life out as it comes, to take the pain and extract from it wisdom, to find the strength beyond the uncertainty. Life is giving you everything that is required. Not some things or a few things, everything. All it asks of you is that you dismantle the delusion of perfection and begin. Here's an idea that's changed my life, right? As uh, has been attributed to Nelson Mandela, uh, the, the, the saying goes, everything is impossible until it's done, right? We view impossibility as this abstract, scary uh, concept implying that something cannot happen, that it's, it's not reality, it's outside the scope of what we are capable of doing or creating. And we feel that. We feel that uh, when we're, we're in the middle of life's trials and tribulations and we feel that push-pull. You know, we feel that when we're working on something and we feel unvalidated. We feel like everything's in vain, like we're putting in time and energy. Where's life rewarding us? Where is that? you know, the, the top of the mountain, the metal, where's the applause? I cannot find it. When we feel that, you know, the, the solution seems impossible. Nothing short of impossible. And what I want to do is kind of debunk that idea and show you how that abstract notion of something that just seems too big, it seems, it just seems insurmountable how you can take that and break it down into very doable, manageable, daily uh, tasks that change your life and your relationship with the word. You know, there's, uh, I want to give you two examples of books that I've read and, and I've talked about them a little bit uh, on the channel before, um, but I don't think in this context of uh, how human beings have done impossible, quote unquote, impossible things and not even realized it until they stepped outside, right? Until they crossed some finish line 
some abstract marker looked back and went, oh my God. And the rest of the world went, oh my God. That's not, that's not realistic. You know, and, and what's incredible is as the impossible was being done, the steps to get there were so small and so commonplace that, that uh, the people carrying out the impossible acts didn't even understand, didn't know. They were just putting one foot in front of the other. And so both stories are, uh, are related to war. Uh, and, and I feel like when you take sort of the darkest elements of mankind, um, stuff that's inconceivable to a lot of us, and you, you see how uh, people were able to uh, get through those situations, it puts things into perspective. Right? We're not dodging bullets here in our own world. Um, and, and, and that idea, you know, it helps ground us, right? So the first is Laura Hillenbrand's book, Unbroken. And uh, Louis Zamperini is the main character in that book. It's one of my favorite books. And he is a, a track star that uh, ultimately goes to fight in the war and his uh, plane is shot down. He goes to a Japanese internment camp and just endures hell, mental and physical torture. He's beaten, he's starved, uh, he's, he's isolated, um, just goes through a, a mental hell from camp to camp to camp, uh, day by day, um, sometimes thinking he would die, really not knowing, malnourished, uh, watching people around him die, get beaten. Like it's, it's a, an environment that um, it would be hard for us to, to comprehend. And one part really struck me in this story. It's when at the end of the war, uh, the prisoners are set free and he's talking to someone about the trip and looks back and says, I'd rather die then do that again. Like I couldn't do that again. It's quote unquote impossible. And I don't think he used that word, but that's the implication, right? There's just no way. And it's like, as, as even as the reader, as you look back, you're like, there's, that is, is not something a human being can endure. It just seems like too much when you look at holistically. But what the prisoners did was take it one day at a time. One awful, horrific, grueling, unfathomable day at a time for years. And then when the point finally came, you know, they looked back and realized that what they had done was unbelievable. One day at a time. And it was just, it was heart wrenching. It was so powerful to have him look back on his own journey and say, that's impossible. Like I could never do that again. I would rather die than do that again. That's how hard it was. That's how just traumatic it was. Yet here he was standing tall. Another example is in the book, Lone Survivor. Right? Uh, Marcus Luttrell is a Navy SEAL and, you know, he's, he's in Afghanistan with three other Navy SEALs um, who are killed in action. And there's a point where he is by himself, um, bit through his tongue, he had a broken back, he's mangled. And he crawls seven miles through the mountains in Afghanistan while being shot at and taking enemy fire. And the portrayal of just slowly moving your body forward inch by inch to safety, again, is something that's unfathomable. That's impossible. That's not something that we can comprehend. I don't even think it's something he can comprehend. Right? And I'm certainly not going to speak for, for, for a, a Navy SEAL, but the, the, the idea is it's, it's just unfathomable.
But one step at a time, one movement at a time, you can create a different reality. So when you take these examples and, and you pull them back down to earth, uh, you know, Viktor Frankl has a, uh, he talks about in his book how suffering is like uh, a gas that will fill any room, right? It's like everyone's suffering uh, consumes them to some extent. And so you may not be at war, but we are all fighting our own battles. And when we are in the midst of the difficult times, it's easy to not think about uh, getting to tomorrow, but think about surviving uh, the whole war, metaphorical war, right? Not just crawling one foot, but looking at the seven mile marker and thinking it's outrageous. So much of life is convincing yourself to move forward one step. And it's, it's just, it's such a trivial thing to discuss. It's, it's not sexy. It's not uh, on its face heroic or exciting. It's the mundane compounded over time. And we need to remember it most when it's hardest to understand. And I talk about it all the time. Right, that Nietzsche quote, those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. It is very difficult to uh, stay fixated on a result that is not there. It's one of the most challenging things about changing your life in the world around you. You know, dreaming is putting things on earth that are not yet on earth. That takes mental fortitude because each step you take, you have to remind yourself that it's for something, that it means something. When you desperately want applause, because look, it's human. You exert yourself, you exhaust enough energy any rational person is gonna say, why the hell have the stars not aligned yet? I don't understand what I need to do. That's what's interesting. People don't talk about the fact that it makes more sense to quit than to carry on. Like to the rational brain, it makes sense that we would say no more. Right? I want to deal with the world that I'm in, not one that isn't built yet. But it's why we celebrate. We celebrate those times that we move forward anyway, that we had the vision to see the unseen and do what so few people can do. That's what makes life beautiful. That's what makes human beings beautiful. You know, we see life through stories. Well, the ones that can write and craft narratives that have not been heard or watched or explored, that's magic. You know, I talk about the evolution of insanity. I, uh, I wrote about this years ago and it continues to be one of the most important things I think uh, that, that, that I've written. You know, this idea, if you take a woman who leaves her everyday life, right, for, for example, and she has this, this passion, this sense of purpose, and she wants to breathe life into it. So she leaves her ordinary world and she starts building and she becomes obsessed with this idea and people around her, by the way, who know her as what she was and what she did, right? They know her uh, based on what they saw yesterday. They say, this is weird, right? but she's locked in and she gets up and she makes it her focus in life. And she continues forward and continues forward and nothing happens. And people point to her. They say, look at her wasting her time. Right? She had it all before. 
This is crazy. And she continues and continues and builds and adjusts and throws her, her understandings and her knowledge and her experiences against the wall. And when they shatter, she picks them up and builds again and again and again. And people say she's delusional. She's insane. She has lost her mind. But she hangs in. She dances without the music long enough to get there. To wherever there is, she gets there. And now the perception's different. Now it's exciting. Now she's not insane to the world around her. Now she's propped up on a pedestal. Now people want what she has. They want to understand how to build what she built. How can we make what she made? How can we do what she did? Right? They call her lucky. And she says, no, for you to call me lucky is insane. Right? What she did was build the impossible with very ordinary, very mundane steps, never losing faith and remembering, and this is the key concept, remembering that all those little trivial steps mean something. And when she steps outside, because we all get there, we will step outside and look back and reflect. We'll look back on the impossible that we built on the magic we created. The thing is, the thing we need to remember that magic is manufactured with very real, practical uh, components of life. Simple decisions. It's like the human brain is so much more than the sum of its parts, right? You can take any element uh, you know, physically of the human brain, and it, it doesn't seem that extraordinary. We can't even explain or understand it, but you put it together and we, we have something that transcends uh, the, the, the biology and the physicality uh, that we look at under a microscope. It doesn't make sense. We haven't quite figured it out, right? All those little pieces become something meaningful. And my point is, we all have our own journey. We're all fighting our own battles. We all are going to get to a point because it's human and in a way it's required where we look around and we question ourselves and we question the process and we don't know if it's worth it. We forget why we started. We can't see the finish line because it's not there yet and we'll only see it if we continue to, to uphold that vision in our heads. That's when it's important to remember what impossible is and how it's made. And every simple decision to step forward is crafting the impossible. I had a call with someone today, very successful individual, right? Uh, very um, skilled and respected in his field, brilliant platform, great communicator, just an all around impressive human being. Right? He says, yeah, but I wanna be one step further. I'm getting frustrated, right? I don't know, like, what can I do to get there? And it's like, I've been in that spot. In fact, I find myself there a lot. And I think it's incredible that you're looking out and asking what pivots can I make? What adjustments can I make? But sometimes what you don't do is more important than what you do. And what you shouldn't do is lose sight of how much you've built. What you shouldn't do is forget that one step at a time creates miracles. That you are well on your way to where you want to be. And yes, ask that question. Ask, how can I evolve? Ask, how can I level up? But never let impatience trump the big picture. Never at the expense uh, of who you are and what you've made. 
Because sometimes life is about just moving forward. Sometimes it's about the trivial. Sometimes it's about the mundane. That's what hurts. That's what gets you. Most people don't quit because of a traumatic experience. Most people don't quit because they took a monumental L. They quit because the little thing doesn't reveal its value. It's very hard amidst the, the, the chaos of day-to-day -day life to remember what you're building, to remember each little step is a brick that will come to uh, evolve into the impossible. dance before the music plays. Believe in the song, believe in the melody, believe in yourself, because there will be a point where you get there. And there is a very abstract thing and it means many different things to many different people, but there will be a point when you arrive. You'll exhale, look back on what you've done and be thankful. So wherever you are, when you lose sight of your journey, think about that moment. Think about how that will feel looking back on what you've made and all those times you could have stopped and didn't, all those times you wanted to say no, but you said yes, they mean something. I'm telling you they mean something, but that is not half as important as the fact that you know it means something. You just need to remind yourself of that fact. So here's to one step more in building the impossible.